even yeah. better. Yeah. yeah. So, so They're tomorrow's, bringing us into the equinox. Tomorrow is the largest global peace celebration of the year. Started wow. today, actually, just was on the That's global really tomb and call people from all over. There's another one tomorrow at, I guess it peaks tomorrow at 5 p.m. Pacific time. Cool. All right, well, let's, let's get this underway. Um, I think we pretty much all know each other. <laughs> Good to see you all. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Aww. But for the sake of anyone who may watch this later on, on uh, the internet, uh, we will introduce our esteemed guests. Actually, most of you are here. This is your home, of course, but um, you know, thanks everyone for coming out to the PCC Forum on this balmy night uh, as we help our friends here launch uh, what started as an idea into the world as this beautiful documentary film um, that premieres tomorrow night. So let's let's run through the, uh, the people who worked on this. There's Max de Armand, of course, who uh, I didn't know this, but has more than 12 years of experience as a music producer and sound engineer in New York City, and has worked with uh, a pretty astonishing list of celebrities and public figures: Philip Seymour Hoffman, Hillary Clinton. 50 Cent, Natalie Merchant, and many others. Red and Man, Method Man. Wu wow. Tang. Add to the list. Okay. Wu <laughs> Tang. Uh, Dio's <laughs> worked on uh, as a producer on over 15 full length albums, and he has more than five years of experience in production, working in film and television, including on the uh, Tina Fey's hit uh, series 30 Rock. I've seen a few episodes of that. That's Max, not me. He's a few. Oh, yeah, I was like, what's happening? Did I, I was like, Theo? geez, Matt, I'm going to introduce the <laughs> <laughs> I, I really wanted to be able to introduce you. <laughs> He's got some good 30 Rock stories. Do you guys want to ask him something? Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, <laughs> and of course, Max is currently in the MA program here in PCC. And I'm sure this isn't the last of his, uh, his projects. And then, of course, there's Missy Laren. Um, Missy has been working in uh, environmental protection uh, as an activist, a lawyer, a board member. Uh, she specializes, specializes in citizen suits and enforcement cases in uh, California's um, uh, courts. Um, currently, she's writing about education uh, and is developing integrative leadership curricula for teens. And her goal in working on this film is to inspire a new generation of agents of change. And uh, just to continue with the introductions, I'd like to introduce Luthia Lillacoy, who is a musician, composer. Um, she has a background in contemporary and classical music, and she's an educator and an artist. She uh, studied classical music at the Conservatory of Madrid, and also studied at the Berklee College of Music, and she got her BA here at CIS. And uh, she wrote the original score for the Future of Energy film. And um, so we get to introduce Theo Badashi, who is a writer of this film and also the lead in the film. He's a current PCC master student. Uh, he's a social advocate and former radio host. He has more than 10 years of experience in media and community organizing. Uh, his work addresses the current shift in global culture and the emergence of new techno-ecological paradigms. So thank you all for coming to speak to us about this project of yours. And, uh, thank you. Yeah, and obviously, with following along the theme of the film, this will be a discussion, and it will, you know, you, you, I know you guys have some things you want to share with us about how the film was realized and all the ideas that you couldn't fit into the film for whatever reason. Um, but it's going to be open for discussion all along the way. Uh, so, Yeah, if at any point you guys have questions and want to know about something specific, just chime in. Yeah. Cool. But just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll just leave how the time is structured to sure. support you and yeah. what you're comfortable with. Um, OK, so. I think it would be good to begin with talking about um, how, why, how, and why it even got to, got here. How, mm -hmm. why is, why is this here? What are we doing? Mm -hmm. um, and what's really amazing about sitting here with all of you is because you are in 
the fabric, you were in the, the field in which this emerged, and in, in specific and subtle ways, you've all contributed on different levels. I mean, it's, it's been such an organic process that we can't really talk about the creation of this story without talking about PCC and CIS and all of us sitting here right now. Um, so essentially, Max and I, um, from, from the beginning, Max was one of the first people I met, Max and Jahan were actually the first people I met, and Travis was probably you know, one, one of the first, the three kind of guys I bonded with. Um, last fall, um, and and then going into Esalen, you know, we were having all these incredible conversations. We realized we're, we had found ourselves in a community for the first time that was really doing the things that we wanted to see in the world. Just even from the initial conversations we were having with people, the mission statement alone of PCC is really what crystallized, and uh, it, you know, it, it it drew us to to that to this community. Um, and then so to be in, in a community of people that were bringing this level of consciousness and this vision forward, um, I think we just felt activated. So, you know, Esalen's a major part of it. A lot of conversations, but the initial seeds of this project really got started in Esalen. Um, Max and I standing next to the ocean. We had no idea what this project was going to be. And then that came into our class with David Kennard and, and Brian Swim that Missy and Max and I had together. Um, in which, you know, we were watching all these cosmological films, and David was sharing with us the creative process and giving us insights behind behind the scenes insights and, and what it is that creates a film. Um, you know, and Max had had a really rich media experience. I've been studying film on my own in different ways over the years. My back, my background is radio and web design, so film was very different to me. I didn't understand the film production process, and so once we began to look at film from a cosmological perspective. We were we began asking questions like, well, where can this lead? What can we do with this? You know, we had kind of these converging things. I mean, philosophy and the whole like, exploration of the evolution of consciousness with this medium that is virtually reflective of the evolution of consciousness mm -hmm. in ways that most people don't even really take into consideration. So when you begin, and also, it, and it's not being used for those tools mm -hmm. usually. It's used for very base level materialistic ways a lot of times. And so to fuse those things together. Um, is, could be incredible. So we got excited about that potential. Um, and it was really with Sean Kelly and Joanna Macy that we began to see what, what needed to happen in the world right now. And so I kind of specifically remember Max did a presentation on the work of Jeremy Rifkin during the, the Joanna and Sean's Great Turning course um, last year. And Jeremy Rifkin is an um, American uh, philosopher, economist, visionary badass, basically, uh -huh. who's gained a lot of traction in Europe because he has this incredible plan that um, li basically lays out how our whole world can shift over into a renewable society using renewable energies, using advanced technologies, using uh, lowering our ecological footprint, all these things. He's worked all the details out. Europe is taking his work very seriously. Um, there's con conflicting reasons why a lot of interests here are not so much, and you know, we can imagine why. So um, I had never heard of him until Max brought him forward. Incidentally, Sean was teaching him later that semester. So we were already in this sort of Jim Rifkin field. Jahan was studying his work and sharing some stuff. And it just seemed um, incredibly coincidental that these conversations were coming out. And you know, kind of on a side note, this concept of synchronicity and coincidence has been so deeply mm -hmm. embedded in the creation of this film that it's pretty clear that we didn't create this film. This, this film is part of a, um, a collective consciousness that needs to come forward. It's, it's a culmination of something else entirely that we were just picking up on and, and acting upon, essentially. So um, anyway, long story short, I remember Max, we were in front of the, uh, it was during a break, we were, or after, after class, we were in front of the school, and Max said, Theo, it's energy. So I was like, energy? What are you talking about? He's like, that's how we shift the world. And I was like, and I didn't, I didn't believe it, because I, you know, I come from an activist background with food, internet rights, social, you know, um, social justice, energy, oil companies. I didn't want to touch it. All that, that big machine. I wasn't really fascinated by it. Not, I wasn't excited about it. So initially, I was not into his idea at all. Um, I will totally admit it. And but he was persistent. He was like, you don't get it. Energy is at the heart of everything. And 
it's reflective, you know, it's symbolic for everything. Energy is everything. Energy is the evolutionary impulse. Mm -hmm. And for us to shift our energy systems is, is, a, is a physical statement of us saying we are shifting our internal mm -hmm. compass, our cultural compass from the inside. Mm -hmm. So that's what got me. I was like, okay, I got chill and talk. Because that, that's, that's next level, that's next level stuff. Mm -hmm. And Rifkin understands that anyone that's really working in the insides of this movement recognizes that. That um, it, you know, the, the the banks and the oil companies are one and the same, essentially the same power structures, a very specific um, fossil fuel based, um, fiat currency based strategy. It is very limited. It's not long term. It's not reflective of a, of a peaceful, um, flourishing, diverse global society. Um, and so. We really we recognize that what our species needs right now is we need storytellers to be to be exploring well what's next and what's what's coming forward and it's not that the answers weren't there once we started this project we found an incredible amount of answers it was how can we articulate them to help people to see that they're there so that was really our big mission um, for the film and that yeah, so the funny thing is we the film that we have now we have no idea six months ago that that was the film. Yeah. We were going to go to Europe and show everybody, we're going to go to Europe. Yeah. Even when we did the Indiegogo, we're like, we're going to, all the money we raised for Indiegogo, we're going to go to Europe and we're going to show them what we, what's going on in Europe. We're going to show them America in the future. Yeah. And then the whole thing changed very quickly uh, with the conference. Can I tell them that? Yeah, they you guys, it's ridiculous how much synchronicity is behind this. It's it's virtually absurd. You, you couldn't write a better story than, of the story behind the story. Um, so we launched our Indiegogo, and we had never launched an Indiegogo. We had never raised that you know, anything out of it. We don't know where we're going. Um, and out of nowhere, like two days into launching it, we get this email from this woman named Kirsten from Copenhagen. And as you guys know, Copenhagen's leading the way of climate. You know, it's all these amazing people in Copenhagen. They're um, you know, doing great stuff with the climate. So we get this message from this woman who says, hey, I love your project. I'm launching a project soon too that's, that's um, an app that gets people informed about all these awesome energy things that are going on around the world. Um, do you guys know about this conference that's coming up like in two weeks? Um, and we're like, no. It ends up being the renewable energy conference, the very first renewable energy conference in the United States. Mm -hmm. It's in San Francisco, it's at Fort Mason. It was, virtually, <laughs> yes, it was virtually the heads of Europe and the United States coming together to talk about what the next energy paradigm is going to be. From a technical perspective, from a financial perspective, from a policy perspective, um, everything, cultural, economic, all across the board. And so we were virtually handed this thing. So we go to this conference, we didn't know what to expect at all. It was our first filming session. You know, we're, we're, we're ragged, like, <laughs> totally sloppy. I'd never been on camera except for that indie thing, you know. <laughs> and we end up basically connecting with some of the most wonderful visionaries on this planet that are really leading the way towards this next energy paradigm in very tangible ways, in very down to earth, you know, um, very serious ways. And so it was like the meeting of the next energy regime, a regime in the positive sense, a regime in just a structural, you know, group in a sense. Um, and so. That kicked everything off. We should point out that we were the only film crew there. Yeah. So we got all the interviews. Yeah, yeah, we got all the interviews. <laughs> wow. And that film became crew. most of the majority of content for our film. Yeah. Oh, wow. All of the people, we got all their contact, we got all their information, we just had a stack of business cards, and we just basically for the next six months went out and journeyed and filmed them in their own Exactly. Mm. We virtually got to choose the leaders of this industry that they had already collected. They had done years of research finding the top people, and they basically said, you guys come and fill them film them, and we did, and we, whoever we had chemistry with, whoever we thought had a great story to tell, who had a powerful vision, they're all underdogs. So we, uh, Kansas, <laughs> so we, uh, I'm not going to tell them all about Kansas. Oh, you got to come to the movie. Tell them the back story. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, Kansas, you know, Kansas had a big impact on this film. This is, a, um, so at the conference we learned Mayor, Mayor Bob Dixon from Kansas, Greensburg, Kansas, this guy's like six and a half feet tall, big, big dude, you know, wonderful, big-hearted, um, from the heart of Kansas, you know, strong conservative, fundamental conservative, 
in, in a very interesting way, in a, in a positive way. Um, so we go out there, and um, th this, this town had virtually been, 2007, their small town in the middle of Kansas had been virtually destroyed by a tornado. And there was a tiny group of people in the town some of them were very progressive and some of them were very conservative and they worked together to create a model for how to redesign a town using all wind energy. Mm -hmm. So they became, if they're not the first entirely... They're one of the only four cities in the United States that are 100% wind energy. Yeah, they're one of the very first. So they're, they're a historical presence. They've shown that you can power an entire city. It's a small, it's a small city, a small town, but it's a, it's a microcosm of what can be, you know. So once we started once we started pulling on that, on that thread to see where these things would lead, we found that it was bringing us into a whole different um, world that we didn't even expect whatsoever. Um, so... Tell me about Lancaster. And then that led us to <laughs> Lancaster. You can see, I'm giving you little gems because you're going to love the story when you guys see it tomorrow night. They're, 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 they're heartfelt, they're great. We literally went on a journey for the past six months. I mean, we had no idea when this thing started. I had no idea. I thought I was going to be reading books or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was hoping I was going to be. Basically. That's <laughs> <laughs> for next time. Yeah, so we got swept up on this journey. So the, the Theo's journey in the film is the real journey we went yeah, on. Yeah, exactly. Mm. So just tell me a little bit about Lang Lancaster. So, we, so we, we come back and we go to Lancaster. And uh, Lancaster down in Southern California. Didn't had no idea. I didn't know where Lancaster was. <laughs> and then we heard of it. Republicans. Yeah. You know, so yeah, two of our strongest characters are these Republicans who are leading the way in the energy revolution. Hmm. I mean, it's because they see that it makes financial sense, first of all. Sure. It's energy stability, so they have control over their energy in their communities. Um, and it just makes sense. They create jobs in their communities. They're not reliant upon fracking. You know, fracking's a huge deal right now all across California. So this guy, Mayor, Mayor Rex Paris, this guy um, was a character. Um, he is... What can I say about Rex? Tough as nails. He was tough as nails. He's, he's, a, he's a prosecution lawyer. And he's the kind of guy that you walk in the room and you don't know if like, you're in admiration or you're totally afraid of the guy. Um, because he's such, a, he's such a powerful character. You can see he's, a lot of these lawyers, I mean, Missy's, Missy knows the world of lawyers. They're a fierce bunch of people. Um, but to see a lawyer like Mayor Paris activated with this bigger solar vision, it was incredible to see him like, fiercely dedicated to switching his whole town over to solar power. So right now, I mean, they're leading the way in California and across the United States. Lancaster, California is 97% solar powered. And they're a city of 150,000 people. Mm -hmm. So they're virtually a model. I mean, the average, it's probably the size of the average decent sized city in California. So if a city that size can power almost their entire city on renewable energy, you know, electricity, um, then it's, it's creating a model for everything else to follow. Um, and the, so, the important point about RACS from a legal perspective is he made solar mandatory. Mm -hmm. So yes. all new construction has to put uh -huh. one gigawatt Kill. kilowatt on their roof. And that's uh -huh. what we need to see in, in every yeah, exactly. town, in every city. And so. so, I mean, we can tell you guys the backstory or whatever, but is there anything that you guys are interested in knowing about specifically? I have a question just about like distribution from here mm -hmm. for the film. I mean, like, what's your guys' plan after the policy winners? <coughs> Sundance. Wow. So we're submitting Sundance this weekend, Monday. Wow. wow. Mm -hmm. so <coughs> then afterwards? <coughs> um, afterwards, it's going to be free to the whole world. That's great, because I, I was involved in this, this other Call of Life documentary, and it was supposed to go viral as well, and it hasn't. Yeah. Uh, so it's been years now that it's finished, um, and it's been showing you know, all over the place for limited, <clears throat> and you can buy it, but um, so I'm, I'm really hoping that you'll stick to the best strategy to get maximum quick yeah. data well, particular. Yeah, we've decided, we've come to the conclusion that it's absolutely essential that we uh, retain ownership of the project. So it's going to be free. Anybody who comes in as an investor has to understand that they cannot have any ownership. Because of the, the importance of it and the value of the content 
is so crucial right now that yeah. you can't let anybody have any say in it. And essentially, we realized that um, we, this, the reason why it's becomes this project has been so fast is because there is virtually, you know, Brian talks about this, Sean talks about this. There is a window of opportunity, an evolutionary impulse that is creating opportunity, both politically because Obama, the, the, we've seen the direction he's going recently, lately. It's, you know, um, but if we if we don't get a major energy transition in the next two years, realistically. If Marco Rubio or any other conservative or anything happens in the next few years, it, it, we might not do it. Right. And if America can't lead that right now, then China is not going to lead it, then India is not going to lead it, and then other emerging powers are, are going to use that as an excuse for them not to do it also. So we actually have a, an actual window of opportunity that we have to infuse a particular vision that is going to be, we want to, to take hold. Um, so basically, we went on this, this whole vision or this whole you know, uh, journey. Learned what the actual plan is, and now we're creating a language for it and articulating it in a way that anybody can say, "Wow, that's it right there. That's how it's going to happen." Mm -hmm. You know, so even people. Well, yeah, there's two two main things. One thing is, eventually, everything's going to be renewable and everything's going to be electric. Yeah. Because of the microchip. Mm -hmm. Right now, we're at that point financially, economically, where it is now cheaper to get solar panels than it is to get coal, and. Fracking is the only reason why natural gas is cheap right now. And it's only 100 to 200 year supply of that. So it's not a long term solution. Um, so eventually, everyone's gonna, everything is going to be electric. Everything's yeah. going to be microchips. Mm -hmm. Just like we have computers now, everything's digital. Electricity is going to be the same way. The real question is basically, the fossil fuel companies have five times the amount of carbon that our atmosphere our atmosphere can hold in their reserves and they want to sell it. They have access to that much. Yeah. They already have that in their reserves. And they could burn it in 20 years if they right. had the plan to. So basically, Schuchberg and other climate scientists are saying by 2017, if we don't curb carbon emissions or reduce them, it's going to go beyond. I mean, the, the Arctic is going to be open <coughs> in our lifetime already. So it's, a, it's like, you know, we're making this film, we're making a joke about it, but the reason why we're making this film is because if we don't get off fossil fuels in the next five years, yeah. it's going to be way more extremely bad than it already could be. Mm -hmm. So there's a certain time sensitiveness mm -hmm. to it. Um, and that's why we made this film in six months, not because we think we know what we're doing, but because we had to, basically. That's why it's going to be free. That's why we're making it a curriculum, you know, an online curriculum. Mm -hmm. I guess what uh, everybody what I just want to know is like how much more effort you put into this aside from like the, the festival and just putting it online, are you gonna push it somehow, market it somehow, just get it out? Like is there the strategy? Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, I mean we have a huge yeah. plan for moving forward. It's gonna be an increment. I mean Well we find out about Sundance to summer time. Right. And so we go one of two directions. If we're into Sundance, there's pretty strict rules about how they like to proceed. <coughs> the film festival is the third week of January, and so we would be premiering in Sundance. And then um, the nice thing about being accepted there is the ability to distribute it is a lot easier. Um, and if we're not chosen for Sundance, we plan to launch in January through all kinds of strategic partners surrounding the United States. Basically, nonprofit groups related to climate change, supporters, contributors, throwing house parties, distributing it for free over the internet, and building a curriculum for schools. Yeah, I mean, basically, before this project started, I didn't know anything about energy. I don't care about energy. I, mean, I never thought about it before. But literally in the last month, I mean, all the people who've been working on this issue for 30, 40 years are like, let's see the film, let's take it to the next level. Yeah. So everybody's coming on board. And no like, one's even seen it yet. No one's even seen it. There is no, it's, it's the most, it's, it's the most important the most issue of our moment. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering how much in your explorations and, and in the film, um, you know, switching from carbon to renewable is obviously a key. Uh, and um, the, the, the energy itself doesn't exist in a vacuum, it exists in a set of social political relations, right? Where, <coughs> 
it's a consumer society where things are produced and they're produced through you know, offshore and through um, finding the cheapest labor, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's not just the, the energy that's used, it's the way things are made and distributed. Uh, and the way that is tied into government subsidies for corporations and the whole legal structure and so on. So this, this um, the ecology of energy as a well, the social, political ecology of energy, how much does that come into your... It's interesting, because when we started, we got a lot of criticism about our Indiegogo thing. Because um, we were like, yeah, let's just go renewable technology and get jobs and make money. And... Uh, it wasn't what we were talking about, it's just how it was It's perceived. how it came across to some people. Um, so I guess that's kind of what you're talking about. And through the process of making the film, we have actually <laughs> been able to incorporate education, community. I mean, we have a whole section of our film about community. Gardening. Community you know, gardens. Lydia's in yeah. the film in her garden. Um, mm -hmm. jo there's a whole scene with Joanna and Theo that's all about the psyche and about dealing with grief and doubt. And, so, social, social justice. I mean, we've social actually justice created this whole integral model. The whole film, we really have racked up, the three of us have racked our brains for the last six months over and over, arguing all night until four in the morning about, you know, what are the arguments, what are, blah, 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 what are the facts, what are, blah, 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 blah. and so now we have this film that we literally, there's a part about divesting from fossil fuels, there's a part about renewable technology, there's a part about energy efficiency, and there's a part about community. And B Corps. And B Corps, businesses. And we didn't learn about B Corps until like two weeks ago. But we had just, we didn't realize that we had filmed all the B Corps. <laughs> like, oh, B Corps are, 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 are socially conscious business models that are really, they're only a few years old. I mean, there have been some companies that have been following that model for a long time. But to actually, as a community, as a B Corp community, they're considered social benefit as a B stands for. So um, it's a new, it's, it's a an new entirely legal new way of. Right. So not just for profit. It, you have almost every own. company. I think every company we did. Every company we filmed was a B Corp. So yeah, now we, we have a section of B Corp. Yeah. So this is like every angle. We tried our best. Even ethnically, I mean, half of our film is women, right? Yeah. Would you say? Um, we definitely tried our best to get as many voices and as different, as many different angles. We were able to sneak in cosmology and philosophy through their narration. <laughs> and gardening, local food, organic gardening, education. We have kids in there talking about their, what they think about climate change. Wow. Twelve-year-olds. Um, oh yeah, I was just gonna ask kind of a two-part question, which was, did you guys end up um, interviewing and filming people who are on the opposing side of this argument? And then also, in making this film, why, if it's economically more sustainable and more viable and in the long run more profitable to go renewable energy, why do you think this switch is so hard? Why are we fracking? Like, what's the point if there's such a limited supply? What was the first question? Did you film people from the opposite side of the no. argument? No. Can I explain why? It's really clear why. I mean, um, if we look at the historical context and where we're at right now, the same forces, the same companies that have, that have a specific relationship to nature are the same ones that are, have been working for hundreds of years, maybe even thousands of years, to control resources to the best of their ability in a way that's really not beneficial to the larger population or the planet. So that's pretty clear. Um, and just by saying, just by asking the question, two questions, is this going to be harmonious to the Earth community? And second of all, is this going to lead us into a sustainable future? If you ask those two questions in any of these conversations that you go into, we, there's no reason to give any lip service to the, the largest companies in the world that, um, that have you know, been, been trying to secure their model. And so the second, to answer the second uh, question, um, was the second question? Was there, was there but why is it, if it's sustainable and profitable, why isn't it happening? Well, okay, because we've been under, because there's there's the myth, there's the myth, they've created their myth, they have a story. They have an entire story of empire, they, they justify empire, and most consumers are okay with that. They're, they're perfectly fine with this idea that we can go around the world using the most powerful might and take things that 
are not ours and not really humans in general. They're just part of the natural process of the earth. You know. Um, so there's also I'd like to take a stab at it and answer to that. So uh, an example came up just in making this film two weeks ago. Um, an acquaintance just closed a venture capital fund of several hundred million dollars, and his plan is to do real estate development because the trends show that we'll need more real estate built. And I talked to him and I said, well, are you going to go net zero energy on all of these new homes that you'll be building? And he said, no, I'm not. Um, it's not cost effective. The costs haven't come down. And we talked about that and he, and he said, but I, I will make them energy efficient. And so even though his fund expects to be extremely profitable, he is not going to go that extra step to make it solar panels, even though he has solar panels on his own house. And so what we need is we need to support the governor and his call for a mandate. He did a press conference for the launch of our first net zero retrofit building, which is here in San Leandro. And he came out on record to launch a campaign to be net zero in residential by 2030, net zero in business by 2020. And the question is, is, will that be a goal or will that be a mandate? And everybody in California right now is arguing about it's it behind the scenes. Right and so the question is, is can we band together, support the governor, and say, let's make it a mandate? And if it was, then that real estate developer would put solar panels on all of his buildings because he has to. And he's the type of person who wants to. Um, so. Yeah, and to add to that, I think more directly to what you're saying, oil companies, since the late 1800s, they fund everything. Politics, the media, everything. everything. They bank all they are the Rockefellers banks. started the public school system, or funded it, you know. Their money is in everything. The reason why, Amer and it's not, the rest of the world is already going there. It's yeah. just America, mm -hmm. and that's why we wanted to make this film. Because America is going to be 15, 20, 30 years behind the rest of the world. That's not because these companies want to, they know it's already going there. They're already investing their money in it. I got documents, nuclear facilities are abandoning their investments and investing in renewables. Um, and it's only, you know, people have been talking about solar panels for 34 years. In the last two and a half years, two thirds of all solar was installed. So we're talking about in the last couple of years is when it really has. Because of the microchip and because of the technology, it has become cost effective. And over the next 20 years, everyone is going to shift to that. It's actually because fossil fuels are finite, right? So the more you use them, the more they cost. The sun is relatively infinite. So it's real simple math when you do the math. Everybody around the world knows it and they're shifting. I mean, we, you know, I don't want to give away all the gems of the film, but. Come and see tomorrow. <laughs> but we will. We'll we are. Come. Yeah, we'll we'll totally come. come. Right there here. are plans for cities all around the world that are going to be run on 100% renewable energy. Um, I mean, I just, just echoing or <clears throat> playing harmony to uh, to what you've already said. Uh, one, there's still there's still a lot of money to be made. Yeah, um, that's my money. guess. And uh, the people that already have money, want to make more money, uh, so, and as, as Max said, That's the it's, bottom line. Yeah, yeah, it's so tied totally. in with, with government and politicians and so on. So that's one reason <clears throat> why it's not happening. But the other answer is, it is happening. It's just a question of whether it'll be, you know, okay. whether the great unraveling or the great turning will, mm -hmm. will be quicker, we just talk about. But, um, Obama's clean energy plan is is natural gas and, and nuclear energy. Mm -hmm. He had the nerve to get up there and talk about climate change and be excited about installing three nuclear power plants while Fukushima is blowing radiation into us all. I mean, that's what we're dealing with right now. He hired the people for his energy plan, his clean energy plan, who are natural gas people. That's why yeah. the natural gas is gonna, you know, everybody, they're trying to sell it. They just wanna sell it. That's all they wanna do. Mm -hmm. They have invested interest, they want to sell it, they put the people in place, all the politicians are bought. It's real simple. And everyone else around the rest of the world knows it. 
Let's let's wish him luck though for the the, the law that was just went down today. Uh, <coughs> the EPA forcing all new, first of all, all new coal fire plants to install carbon uh, sequestration and storage technology. Because mm -hmm. um, the carbon the car the coal plants are like thirty eight percent of. Uh, are responsible for 38 percent of the CO2 emissions. Mm -hmm. um, this, and if they had the uh, um, sequestration and storage technology on them, it would reduce their footprint by around uh, 60 to 70 percent, which is really, really significant. So this new law, which is already being totally attacked by the GOP and by the, the uh, coal and oil industry, it only applies to new coal plants, of which there are hardly any. Uh, but it's the first step that he, that he and his administration and the EPA are going to do. Uh, and the, the resistance is already just massive. Yeah. So yeah. let's at least hope that that. that <clears throat> I mean, I appreciate, I appreciate what he's trying to do. But the truth of the matter is, when you install infrastructure, we're talking about what's, it's going to affect us for 30 years. Yeah. Right? They're talking about this energy transition is going to take 30 years. Right? They're looking, we basically could shift, we have Stanford professors who've done the math. We can shift the whole world to renewable energy in 30 years. Simple. It can be done economically and uh, technologically. The problem is social and political yep. will. That's yep. it. That's the only thing stopping us from trans. And what we're talking about is yes, we're still going to need fossil fuels to transition. But while we're investing our money, our taxpayers' money, into infrastructure that's going to be around. For 30 years, we have to be investing all that in renewable energy now yeah. to, to wean us off. They're installing coal plants. They're installing. That's, that's going to be. Yeah. What, are, what are they doing? The the XL pipeline. I mean, that's that's going to be around. What, I mean, it's a short. It's so short sighted. Um. But anyway. Yeah. In all the interviews that you guys did, uh, was there any talk about? Something like a carbon tax mm -hmm. to encourage divestment in fossil fuels. How realistic does that seem? I, mean, I know. Yeah, I don't know how realistic it is. I mean, carbon tax is vital. It's absolutely essential in specific areas. Mm -hmm. We chose not, we chose not to include carbon tax in the film at this point. We, we might in the future, uh, but right now it's not in there because we want to get people. We want to show people what's happening. We want to yeah. show people the vision about how amazing stuff is. And the moment you start talking about taxes in a film, it's it's, it's it taints because people have a somatic response. Taxes are not taxes. You know, it's, it's, mm -hmm. So it's, it's a complex issue. There's a ton of complex energy issues that we chose not to cover. Mm -hmm. um, but carbon taxes, yeah, of course. You gotta, yeah. you know. One of the things I've, I've been hearing about uh, the speculation that Obama might allow the Keystone pipeline to be built in exchange for the imposition of a, of a gradually increasing carbon tax, <laughs> um, which is like, okay, but. I don't like that compromise between mm -hmm. politics is built on, I guess. I wouldn't trust any compromise to yeah. I don't trust his energy policy. Right. We can't trust his energy policy. Yeah, I mean, there's so much that the, the, the EPA actually has a lot of power and it's not being used. Yeah. Um, he doesn't need to go through Congress. If he wanted to do the things, he needed to do it. For sure. Yeah. So, you want to know a fun fact talking about taxes and all that? Mm -hmm. So, everybody talks about subsidies for renewables, right? And everyone's like, oh, we can't do renewables without subsidies. What was Mark, uh, Marco saying? It's like two years away. No, the, uh, the, the fossil fuel companies have received over $600 billion in subsidies over the last seven years. Mm -hmm. yep. And what do we get? Nothing. We got to I mean, destroy the plant. That's plan. taxpayers' money that virtually is being given to these companies. They said if you take the subsidies the away from fossil fuels, solar is automatically cheaper, mm -hmm. just like that. Mm -hmm. And either way, it's becoming more, it's becoming cheaper. In the next five years, it will virtually be the cheapest energy available in mass. It's going to be incredible. Mm -hmm. And the, the bigger cultural shift, and this is what Jamie Rifkin's talking about, is the third industrial revolution. So what we're doing is we're switching to the, the resource is abundant, right? It's abundant. And the technology is digital. It's the same thing like media, right? We used to have these uh, radio stations or TV stations that had to send their signal out or whatever from broadcast. a tower, broadcast, uh, to everyone's homes, uh, top down. Now, everyone creates their own information and shares it yeah. digitally. It's going to be the same thing with energy. Every single building is going to generate its own energy. And we're mm -hmm. going to share it. We're going to buy, sell it. People are already doing that. 
We're going to have electric cars being charged by solar panels. Right, you, charge, you literally just plug your electric. We were driving this Tesla around. There's no engine. There's no, uh, so engine? There's no engine. When you go in the hood, there's a spot for a picnic basket. <laughs> <laughs> there's no engine. What else? There's no oil, no gas, and the brakes last the life of the car. I mean, everything is going to go that way. It's just a matter of time. It's incredible. You're, yeah. you're basically driving a, a MacBook Pro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's got a computer, full, full blown computer in there. I mean, what will we realize? It's made in China, powered by coal fired plants. Right. Well, that's, right, that's, the other that, that's actually what I was getting ready to say is that we have all these new technologies, like electric cars, like we have these great machines and cell phones and things that allow us to communicate. I mean, I think that we agree that's the benefit of our technological revolution, at the very least is the power of communication. Um, sharing ideas, evolving consciousness as fast as we can in the most positive ways. Um, but, we're going home, we're charging electric cars using coal plants. We're charging our cell phones using you know, natural gas and coal. Mm -hmm. um, it's almost amazing to think that the same technologies that are being used, the same dirty energies that are being used 200 years ago, are now still being used in this incredibly advanced digital age of ours. I mean, it's almost absurd to think about it that way. You know. Um, so there's a lot of concerns. There's, there's a ton of ecological concerns. You know, the ecological impact of the solar panel. Uh, you know, that's these are important concerns that we need to be debating as communities. Right. But the interesting thing is, first of all, there's a one-time cost. Um, the actual long-term impact. You know, to keep this system going, we need to be extracting resources in some form. At this time, mm. did you come across mm. any any of your uh, scientists or people mention? Uh, <clears throat> Like a couple of years ago, when I, I uh, co-taught this course with Stephen Harding, mm -hmm. he's a guy at Gaia Theorist, and he had been talking to people who said that if uh, we put solar panels on you know, enough roofs, that's going to change the albedo of the Earth mm -hmm. and raise the global temperatures. Mm -hmm. uh, and he also said that if we put up enough uh, turbines, that the the uh, uh, the that will affect the, you know, the kinetic energy of the atmosphere or not. Yeah, uh, so both anything. combined, both combined. And because the, the, the wind is, I mean, the solar panels, panels part in the albedo I can get. Uh, but then I was thinking, oh, this doesn't make sense. Because so many of the roofs are already yeah. dark, and can't we just put them on I mean, the dark roof? I mean, they're black. That's such that a you huge come across anybody saying, you know, well, never But I think the negative externalities mm -hmm. of the alternative energy sources are something that we need to know Definitely. and understand. Yeah. Sure. And yeah. So it's the yeah. research. We'll have to do the research before we launch. And what and what Sean's saying about being made in China, they are made in China. And most solar panels are made in China still. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know. And most most electronics are. Right. Mm -hmm. All of our stuff is. Um, what we're hoping is that like once, you know, once you create. Once everybody has, we're going to have, I mean, either we're going to abandon our civilization altogether, which I'm okay with. I'm down for going all natural. Um, I, I'm not. Okay. Yeah. But if we're going to continue to have a civilization, we are going to need to extract resources and use resources. But the whole idea is to use them wisely, to have the least impact possible, to do it in a thoughtful, caring way, um, instead of just destroying everything just for cheap yeah. mm -hmm. parts. Mm -hmm. At least that's my mm -hmm. And that's um, the same note, just to kind of comment on that really quick. That's really essentially what a major part of this great turning is from my perspective. Some some of you know Jahan and some of you know people who have conversations with that's part of my tech my philosophy on technology. I'm a I'm a that's what I focus on is how we can actually create technologies that promote advanced consciousness but are also harmonious with the planet. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's a huge debate, you know, it's, it's almost unfathomable. But essentially we're moving towards biodynamic, um, biomimicry. Everything is biomimic, you know, in which we, the things that we create reflect that which the universe creates. And so for now, we have these solar panels. In 20 years, the panels will probably be this big. Right. You know what I mean? And they'll have a tiny footprint. And then in 100 years, in 1,000 years, who, who knows where we're going to be generating energy from? We're going to be we're going to be growing all of our own clothes, you know. Yeah. Like, it's it's this whole thing that, yes, it's it's where technology could take us if people like us in this room right now stay engaged with the conversation, and not say, oh, I don't want to be involved in technology because of this or that reason. 
We all use cell phones, we're all using lights. We all came here because we enrolled on the internet. You know, so we have to be honest with our relationship with technology, and we have to be kind of bold and assertive with our fierceness of saying, okay, there is a path that this can go that in a hundred years or a thousand years or less than that, hopefully, mm -hmm. can be absolutely beautiful in which the greatest principles that we're working to promote as a species are balanced by technologies that are harmonious with the planet. Mm -hmm. um, so personally, I see this project as part of that turning the conversation in that way. And that's where the cosmology of the story comes in. We, mm -hmm. we, have, we have philosophy in the film in that sense. So. Mm -hmm. Super, super important, and so I applaud you guys for that a lot. And then the other thing that you mentioned, which I'm wondering if you address in the film, you said something about healing. There's a section on healing, or just the psychology of humanity that we are so short-sighted, and how do you heal that wound that we don't have it within us to have faith that we're going to be okay if we sacrifice a little bit? And politicians will talk about Obama talks about it all the time that we have to think about future generations, um, and yet every decision is made or pushed back for 10 months, or we're at the debt ceiling bullshit again, or whatever, you know, whatever. So like what, there's a, there's a humanity under all this, and how do you deal with that? And how do you heal that so that these decisions are made for the long term, and not just for the short term? So I'm wondering, just if you guys have more insight into that, or if you talk about it in the film, or... If you come tomorrow, Joanna will be able to teach you. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I think... Um, it's true, but she will. Um, also, we show, in all the different solutions that we show, that we really aren't making very many sacrifices by yeah. choosing the renewable option. We filmed all these buildings that are net zero energy in the state of Kansas. You walk into the school, and you Beautiful feel school. like you're in a five-star spa it's because it's mm. cool geothermally, and so when you breathe the air, you're like, why do I feel so? It feels so clean and it's so full of oxygen and that's zero right. net building. It has almost no it carbon footprint. It's unbelievable. Um, it's a massive school. So on that note, Theo, tell them about the thing that we just realized last week. <laughs> wow, which thing? <laughs> which thing? Which one? Uh, about the dead ends. Well, here's the super cake. Uh, and this is, we allude to this in the film, we say in the film, um, but since we're talking about philosophy and, and evolution and everything, we had this, Max had this re realization that we all had, it kind of erupted amongst all of us at the same time. We've virtually been powering our world up to this point. The entire global civilization that we know right now has essentially been run on dead energy. Mm -hmm. The death of things that have been in the past. So. And it's almost strangely symbolic that a lot of times we have to create more death to get that, to get that dead energy. Mm -hmm. There's this interesting negative death presence in the whole system, the whole energy structure that goes totally unrecognized. And we don't, who knows what that impact is having on our collective psyches, mm -hmm. on the, um, you know, all the subtleties of nature. To, you know, I mean, I don't know if you guys have seen the show in the film, but. Have you seen how they extract coal? They blow up freaking mountains. They blow them up with dynamite, like mountains the size of this whole thing you can see in front of you, just coming down. I mean, it's traumatic. It's it's you know. So this whole concept of that we've been living on dead energy for this time, and then with these new technologies, it is virtually tapping into the living impulse of the universe. Mm. The same creative forces that virtually create our solar system, that lie at the heart of every star. It, it was birthed from the center, from the omnis center, whatever we want to call it, um, is the energy that we can now draw upon to create a new energy system. So there's a whole relationship to the living impulse of the universe that's embedded in this new energy paradigm that most people don't even take into account. Mm -hmm. So, and that, that dawned that on just us. Dawned on totally us. We just dawned on us. So we were luckily, we wrote it in the script real quick. Yeah, Theo, we recorded the section. Yeah. We've been doing the final tweaks in the past few days. We've been up to nice. four in the morning for, I don't know how many days now, I mean, weeks now. So how long is the cut? No? Six, 65 minutes. It was supposed to be 20 minutes. 
It's a full, yeah, it's a feature length, but it's a short feature length. So this is the whole time I was like, it's 20 minutes. Theo was like, no, man, 30, 30. 30. <laughs> like, no, 40. 20. Yeah. <laughs> I'm only making a 20 minute film. To be a documentary short, which was our intention, it has to be less than 50 minutes. Yeah. And that it's been inching up bigger and bigger, and so we just finally threw in the towel and changed the category, so it's now a feature. Yeah. Feature film. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that perhaps you could let me be come up with a 55 minute version of it. Or sorry, even shorter. For PBS, we could do a 58 minute version. Mm -hmm. could, you know, mm -hmm. In the future, we're going to be flexible with how we present it, as long as it doesn't sacrifice the, the essence mm -hmm. of the film. Mm -hmm. But, so, there's just, I, I think um, all of you especially will see, I mean, every scene, every bit, every, every, moment that's being experienced in the film has been so deeply debated, thought over, philosophized. Um, we did our best. I'm sure there's flaws. There's major flaws. It's our first film. Yeah. You know? We don't know. We, do, we don't really know what we're doing. In fact, we're handing surveys to everyone in the audience mm -hmm. to give us feedback so that we can make adjustments. Up. It is the first, it's the first draft. It's a screening. Actually. We're doing a screening tomorrow, <laughs> and there's 500 people RSVP, but we're doing a screening. And <laughs> um, we're gonna make you're gonna hand everyone a survey, get their feedback, and then hopefully make corrections and premiere on Sunday in January. That's good. And I think Matt, to your question about the carbon tax, is it's issues like that that we need to find out from our audience mm -hmm. if we need to give the nuts and bolts on issues like that. If our audience just needs to know what's happening or needs to know the position, so mm -hmm. that's the kind of stuff we want to do. It's great. Yeah. Got source. Works. Yeah, we're using it as an opportunity to really just to listen. We invited a ton of incredible people. You know, this community first and foremost, you know, and and the people that help fund the film. You know, these are the first two communities that really are coming to to the table. That we need them. We need all of you. You know, because the value on a deeper level that, that you all have to contribute. It's incredible. You know, so um, so it's, yeah, it's a twenty. It's a five hundred person uh, sample. Study, you know, um, that's, that's what we're using it as. And you mentioned a curriculum. I'm a little bit curious about that. Yeah, I'm hearing more about what that is. And also, um, I'm imagining if you've got background in web design, that there is a website that will stay. It will be. We have some. We have some things ahead of us. Mm -hmm. We have some pretty big stuff that we'd like to see. That needs to be seen. Because it would seem like if you did something like the carbon carbon tax, you know, or like surveyed the audience to see what else they wanted. But there's room for all that space for yep. people see the film and go to the website. Mm. And we've definitely been putting feelers out there. There's some amazing websites. 350.org yeah. is an incredible resource. And uh, Citizens Climate Lobby, which is following the carbon tax, for example, also is an incredible resource. So, you know, we have feelers out there to see if we should co-create or co-host an um, interactive website with really the latest and greatest of the technologies mm. and the various bits of legislation that are on the governor's desk and what we should do to get the support out there, like SB4 and SB43, which are really relevant to us as Californians, are critical. So we hope to bring the website in so that our viewers know what's happening. Yeah. And the curriculum piece, we talk about what you're doing. Mm. Well, we miss these. Well, so I have a 12-year-old daughter. She's in the film along with uh, 10 of her 7th grade friends. Mm -hmm. And it's a really nice element in the film to bring the climate debate really in almost like a focus group. And we sat with them for an hour or two. We presented to them the latest in the climate findings from the Schuckerberg talk. And then we really apologized for our role, our generation's <laughs> role. And, mm -hmm leaving this legacy for them to deal with, where they're, they'll really find themselves at the tipping point, mm. more so than us. People say that our generation is living in more of a golden age, but their generation will have to pick up the pieces. And so we talked to them on camera about how they feel about this and how they like to move forward. And so it's a really compelling element of the film. And a lot of them are coming to the screening. And so it'll be interesting to see if the content is appropriate for 12 and up, and then we'll do focus groups to see what age group our film 
to speak to you, and we've been talking about doing a shorter version that will go into schools. Mm -hmm. um, PBS, for example, is a vehicle that builds a curriculum around a documentary film. Uh -huh. So that could be an option to explore. Yeah, I mean, we basically have a call to action. That's, that's the web, I mean, that's kind of what we're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. So the website, full blown, will be an interactive, what you can do. If you're a student, here's exactly what you do. Call your principal, get solar panels on the roof. Why do we not have solar panels on the roof at CIS? You guys, we're going to campaign hard to get this. Yeah, that's coming, that's coming next month. You're going to get an email. And to get our money out of Bank of America, who's a major oil. Well, I bet you CIS is invested in fossil fuel companies. Bank of America. I mean, if we want to be the conscious yeah, really. graduate school, we, got to put, we can get solar panels on the roof tomorrow. So longevity will come and install them for no money down. And cut the electric bill. And cut the electric save bill, the and it'll save money. You know, ten, twenty thousand dollars. I mean, you know, it's that simple. There's companies out there that will just come put them on your roof, lower your bill, just like that. So there's going to be a whole. We didn't put the call to action in the film. We were debating about that for a long time. The film's really the vision. The it's film is just convincing happening. people that it's possible. Yeah. We were, we were like, gotta put the call to action. And we're like, all environmental films put the call to action, and nobody watches them. So we're gonna make the website the call to action. Put your heart. The website featured at the end of the film. Yeah, but essentially, there's enough stuff in the film that people say, "I could do that." Right. Like, oh, that's I, I totally want to get involved. In that. We're just trying to get people inspired that this is even possible. Because when we started this film, we didn't think it was possible. Yeah. In fact, it. we were like, America needs to be 50 percent renewable energy by 2080. <laughs> and that was a good goal. Now we're like 100 percent renewable by 2030. Yeah. It's happening. Yeah. Like, it's that simple. And we didn't have that confidence before, and through this process, we've learned all this stuff. We're like, oh, it's really, it's really, really good is happening. Yeah. Yeah. You want to speak about the score of the film, or the score? Of the film? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, um, I've just been thinking um, when, when you guys are speaking because um, the energy, literally, that has been you know, fueling the whole project is what has also inspired me to make the, the music. And at first it was more of a, oh, this is so cool, I get to score a film. You know, it's the first time that I actually score. I've lent my music to film projects, but it's the first time that I'm actually composing in front of the image, uh, which makes it really enjoyable creative process. Um, so at first it was that novelty, you know, um, but then, really seeing how these guys work together, and how the not only the you know not only the film but also the way they that they're relating to each other and they're talking about all these issues and they're learning about them every day and they're just kind of they have this momentum you know and um, it's really it's just really inspiring for me. Um, and you know, I feel like I'm part of the team. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's that's really cool. And and it's you know it's it's also been really um, a, a, a really good challenge for me to get um, because a lot of the music is the emotional fabric of that you know, that carries things through many times. That I feel that way. Um, and to keep it, you know, to keep all the technical aspect of it and all the cues and all the um, you know, keep it light in a way, but you know, just as well as keeping that like driving emotion has been a really good challenge. So, um, and beautiful scenes that I got to, you know, listen to over and over again, and um, just over and over again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, is like, the music mostly uh, uh, MIDI or or, uh, or sampling or? It's, uh, I'm using my um, weighted keyboard uh, mm -hmm. with Logic, which is, you know, the program that I use. Um, and it's all, yeah, it's all digital plugins, mm -hmm. but I've, I've tried, you know, to make it as um, believable as possible wow. in yeah. the orchestral yeah. way. But, you know, yeah, we'll see, we'll see. Mm -hmm. when, when you hear the piano so. stuff, that's messed with you. She, she, she scores the beginning of the film, so she really brings us into the beginning of the film. She scores a Duana scene, which is incredible, in parts of the end of the film. Mm -hmm. So it's this beautiful, she kind of holds the whole film emotionally. What a team. 
Yeah. And we've all been living together for a <laughs> And your filmer, I can't remember his movie, the, 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 the Brett. filmer. Yeah. Yeah. Brett, the director. He couldn't make it because he has a couple of touch ups. But he's been incredible. He's been absolutely incredible. Mm -hmm. The guy is a warrior. So yeah. He is so, so fierce. His heart is so big. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, he just has not left. I mean, you know, initially, he hasn't it, left his desk. He hasn't left his desk. <laughs> this was Max's vision. Max, you know, the universe came through Max and said, this is what needs to happen. <laughs> Brett's the one who's like it making it yeah. look and feel in certain ways. Mm -hmm. And Miss, you know, and essentially the role of Missy and I, uh, Missy and I were, we, we wrote all the narrations together, mostly you know, her and I. Max would come in and say, these are the arguments we need to make. You know, he'd see the story, <laughs> he'd see where it's going. We were already primed on the arguments, so we knew we'd been sitting there studying them. I would write something crazy, because he would just take her samurai sword and slash it. <laughs> Ruthlessly slash it. Um, in ways that were so spiritually purifying for me that like, I, I, I enjoy it now. Um, and, then, uh, and, then with Thea, and then with Thea would bring life to it again. I would, I would go record it, you know, whatever hour of the night or the morning or whatever we'd be doing. Right, all of the emotion that I took out of it she would put back in with the music. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because we can't have that many words. Mm -hmm. you know? that so we have to make yeah. the point really clear. Uh -huh. And so that's why it was invaluable mm -hmm. to hear the tracks that she would lay because in the early drafts of the film, there was just a soundtrack behind all the different stories. But then when she built it to let us know how we should feel while mm -hmm. we were listening, it's wow. so compelling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's really fun to hear it happening in the other room because I, I hear Theo's narration and then I listen to Lucia as she builds the emotion. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Oh, I love that. It's been pretty awesome. It's been, yeah. And I mean, Missy's family, you know, has been amazing to let us live in this house that they recently acquired. You know, they're mm. remodeling and doing all that stuff too. Um, and so we wouldn't have we wouldn't have that vessel. It's been a vessel. It's been an alchemical. Mm -hmm. Secured vessel in that way. And wow. so much stuff has happened. You know, we all wake up, we're uh, down the hall from each other. <laughs> you know, Yay! Like, get up! 8 30 or 9 o'clock every morning, you know, when you hear that act of footsteps, you know it's Max waking up with an idea. <laughs> it's like two hours of sleep. And when you were talking about sacrifice, making a sacrifice, and a lot of what we show in the movie is that to go 100% renewable is not a sacrifice. Um, we pick a perfect lemon from somebody's garden. We show the Tesla, which is such amazing innovation, and it's the highest performing car of all time on the road, and it's all electric. The house that we're going to be building will be net zero, and it only costs just 1% more in new construction to build a totally sustainable green house that's highly efficient. And it's really exciting to have that as a goal and hopefully maybe even show how it's done for the people out there, the new construction. So, and with that said, all of you are invited to the, to the VIP tomorrow at 5.30. Okay? okay. Be nice to kind of come, hang out. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a small group, but it's going to be a nice group. So um, it would be great for you guys to be there. Where, Where do we come? Palace of Fine Arts. Just come there and yeah. we'll see what we know. Yeah. Yeah. And then afterwards, we're having an after party down the street. So yeah. if you want to come there, yeah, too. Um, yeah, it's just a few blocks away. It's in the same neighborhood. So it would be great to <laughs> celebrate with all of you. And um, you know, this is a continuous process. You know, this is a community process. We, we want feedback from all of you. We're not attached to anything. We want the most potent thing to come forward. And to do that, we've had to sacrifice so much of our egos on so many different levels. Mm -hmm. You know, Missy and I staying up late, six hours writing something, and I'm pouring my heart out. <laughs> All my academic, oh my god, this is incredible. And then it just completely gets, and then, you know, and it doesn't make it. It's just incredible. It'd be like if Sean Kelly, like, Ripped your paper in front of you, and it's like, there you go. And like, <laughs> <laughs> you know. it's, it's, a, it's a purification process. And so that's, um, that's, that's what we need if we're going to make this larger shift of species right now. And so it's, it's a larger conversation that we all get to have. And we don't know what film will be released in January yet. Mm -hmm. It will be a process over the next 
a few months. I mean, this will be the, the film that you see tomorrow will be the film that goes to Sundance, but everybody's comments and input on content will, will incorporate into the, the film for January. Mm -hmm. saying that all your energy, you know, how, however it comes through, it really filters in and really goes into the film because you've been a part of it from the beginning, you know, and I really feel it in this community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it is, it's a PCC film. It's a CIS film. It's a PCC film. Every word of it, really. It is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. <laughs> So PCC figure in the credits in Well, you have to come well, up with special things. You, you, you gotta come see. You gotta come see. No, no. I think you sold us. I think we're all coming. No, no, I'm good. No, I might need to know about snacks. Yeah. I don't want to know about that. I'm still thinking about what, what you said to you in the beginning of, of uh, what you've been sharing with us tonight about energy and sort of restoring the way mm. that we think about mm -hmm. yeah. energy. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I would like to think about this too. In the context of industrial civilization, energy is defined as the ability to do work. Mm -hmm. And it's usually thought of in the context of entropy and this notion that uh, there's a sort of scarcity of energy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, connecting this to this idea of biomimicry and the importance of becoming making human, the human economy congruent in the end with the ecology of the Earth and the larger cosmic ecology that includes the sun and, and the stars ultimately and everything. You know, we can learn something, we can, we can learn, I think, a social, economic lesson from the sun because it, it's, it's the sun and the photosynthesis of plants, it's the original gift of society. There you go. And, a lot of times we think that uh, human power plants are actually creating energy somehow, but they're not. They're just mm -hmm. taking it from somewhere else and transforming it so that we can use it in a different way. Uh, the only, the only um, real power plants are plants, in the sense that they're the only ones bringing the energy into this planet every day, right? And we can, we can, we can learn that I mean, the lesson is there before everyone can see it every day. And we can learn a lot also from bacteria. Uh, so, you know, you, you guys are talking about sharing energy laterally in a distributed way. That's how bacteria share genes mm -hmm. across their membranes. You know, when, when one part of the colony needs something and this other part of the colony has the genes and metabolize the enzyme, to get the enzyme to metabolize in the food source, let's say over here, that gene will get there immediately. That's incredible. And it's, you know, that's how life evolved for, for the wow. years before there was a multicellular yeah. organism. And that was, that was the foundation for multicellular yeah. organisms. We're at, our bodies are highly organized, cooperative societies. Yeah. You know? And I think so much of what you're saying about the technology is that, that's already in place and waiting. It, it, it needs these new ideas, these new stories, and these new ideas yeah, for sure. to, to get the social will to shift, to, to pick up those tools and start using them. Yeah. And it's amazing how quickly we can get the information. Mm -hmm. The same way that gene is going right across the bacteria, if we needed anything, it's so easy to pick up the phone right. and through the internet by finding who is the expert and just call them and say, help us with this content, and it's just there. Mm -hmm. It enabled us to make the film so quickly. Mm. Right. So you're, you're not just talking about it, you actually were participating in the Yeah. We're an active head. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it occurs to me too if, if folks are really being good capitalists, they cut out the middleman and go to the source, which is the sun. <laughs> you know? like, yeah. Stop going through all this dead shit that's taking you. 
Is it more efficient? Well, it might change, it might change <laughs> our consciousness. And that was one thing that Max and I were talking about um, a while ago, is that you know, consciousness impacts matter, but matter has a powerful impact on consciousness as well. Mm -hmm. And so when we begin, when enough people have the focused intention to shift the physical reality around them, there's a, there's a lot of deeper spiritual presence and philosophical presence in the idea of switching over to a new energy system. But people don't even realize when they're doing it. So that alone creates a whole way of looking at things that once that becomes commonplace, that can have an incredible impact on all these repercussions, on education systems, on food systems, on the economy. I mean, switching over to a new energy system virtually might bring in a new economic system because it, it, it creates a whole different relation with power, with community, with self-sufficiency, with harmony with nature. Um, there's amazing implications in that. And on that note, the, the metaphor of power, literally taking our power back, or being empowered by owning our own power and creating our own power. Mm -hmm. um, and so many of the people who have ruled the world for the past couple hundred years own the power, yeah. literally, and figuratively. So there's this weird thing going, this weird dance going on. Power, power struggle. And I think this, you know, this idea about an economy of scarcity versus an economy of abundance is really central in the shift too. That it's a whole, you know, it's a whole different system. And the power isn't going to work the same way if there's enough to go around. You know, yeah. there's enough to go around. There's plenty enough to go around for everybody. And everything we need. So. So. <laughs> you need a good night's nice sleep. Yeah. <laughs> I think you need a sleep. I think you need a good night's sleep, right? Yeah. Come Sunday. on, Matt. Sunday night. Sunday night, I'll get a good night's sleep. Not yet. <laughs> what if we could give you a group hug? Oh, oh yeah. Come on, Sean. Okay. Um, so you, you get in the center here. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, 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 yeah.